This is BBC One in the South East. Now the news at 10 o'clock with Michael Burke and Mike Embley. The Middle East peace summit stalled and turned into a shouting match. On the streets, another day of bloodshed and mass protest across the region. Peter Mandelson, the pressure's back over the home loan from Geoffrey Robinson. Young British gays are gambling with the AIDS virus, a special report. And now it's Europe's turn. The worst floods for a decade bury parts of Italy in mud. And here in the southeast, victims condemn the secret court deal that kept this child abuser out of prison. And London's new transport boss, we meet the straight-talking New Yorker who wants the tube to run all night. Good evening. The peace summit brought together in Egypt today by President Clinton to try to halt the tide of violence that threatens to engulf the Middle East is bogged down tonight. There's apparently been no progress, the atmosphere is said to be bleak, and at one stage the negotiations turned into a shouting match. Israelis and Palestinians are still killing each other on the streets. Israeli soldiers shot a Palestinian policeman dead in the Gaza Strip. More than 40 people have been wounded on the West Bank. Uh, special correspondent Ben Brown is there. On the sands of Gaza, young Palestinian rioters seem to have no fear. They bombard an Israeli jeep, and then, even though this soldier opens fire on them, they pursue him with their stones. He is alone for a moment, cut off from his colleagues, and he flees in terror. Israel's security forces may be powerful, but they cannot simply crush this uprising. The Palestinians take casualties, but it doesn't deter them. And violence has erupted again on the West Bank, too. Israelis and Palestinians fighting it out. While their leaders talked about how to stop all this, at their summit in Sharm el-Sheikh. Expectations of success are low, but the stakes could hardly be higher. Well over 100 people have been killed in these clashes and more than 3,000 injured, the vast majority Palestinians. This was the funeral today for Rayed Hamoudi. Two more children left without a father and a new generation learning to hate. These paramilitary fighters urge their leader Yasser Arafat to make no compromises, no concessions during the summit. On a day the politicians have been talking about peace, these young Palestinians have been showing off their weapons of war. They have little interest in talks, little expectation they'll succeed. And as far as they're concerned, the uprising they call Intifada 2000 goes on. Mourners went straight from the funeral to attack Israeli forces once more, with rocks and later with live bullets as well. Israeli troops retreated but returned fire. And we got caught in the middle as Ramallah again became a battlefield. In Bethlehem too, people raced for cover as bullets flew around this hospital. Inside, a family grieved for a 13-year-old boy shot in the head by Israeli troops. Even if by some miracle today's summit comes up with a peace deal, for this mother it will be too late. Ben Brown, BBC News on the West Bank. Tonight, with no sign of progress, all seven leaders at the summit are meeting for dinner. Earlier, President Clinton urged both sides to stop trying to blame each other for the recent violence. From the summit at Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, James Robbins reports. President Clinton has come to the Egyptian desert in search of a ceasefire. The killing is destroying his eight years' work to build a permanent Middle East peace. But Bill Clinton quickly found that all the trust he has painstakingly built between Israelis and Palestinians is gone. Israel's Prime Minister Ehud Barak has hardened his stance. The Israeli public is demanding greater toughness, not concessions. And the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat wants Israel's troops withdrawn before, not after, any ceasefire. President Mubarak. So, addressing the two sides, for President Clinton pleaded, almost begged, process. for a return to peacemaking. The future of the peoples involved here, the future of the peace process, and the stability of the region are at stake. We cannot afford to fail here. In order to succeed, though, once again, we have a situation piled high with grievance. We have got to move beyond blame. 
but both sides are still playing the blame game and amid so much anger of progress there has been no sign till now there is no progress and the atmosphere is not improving president clinton stayed above the fray walking the golf course hearing reports of outright slanging matches running on as darkness fell i am not surprised that uh, tempers are flaring high we have been subjected to violence for two weeks. The Palestinians also have suffered. So after a truly awful day, witnesses speak of slanging matches between Israeli and Palestinian ministers. Bill Clinton has asked the leaders here to dinner. Over dinner, the president hopes to work his persuasive magic one last time in this presidency, to draw the two sides closer together, hoping to create the climate for real dialogue tomorrow. But there's no guarantee of success. James Robbins, BBC News, Sharm El Sheikh. Well, our Middle East correspondent Paul Adams is at the summit meeting in Egypt. Paul, is it really as bleak as it sounds? Has there really been no progress at all? This has been a desperately hard day. This is as hard as it gets. But certainly in the last hour or so, one begins to get some faint glimmer of progress. Uh, after the talk earlier on about uh, slanging matches, about raised voices, now we understand that the parties who are still negotiating in the building you see behind me are finally getting down to the real nitty-gritty, the, the real substance of the, of the deal that they have to work out. And it may be that by the, the end of tonight, with President Clinton still here, he's delayed his departure until tomorrow, uh, the, the two sides may agree on some form of document. It may come in the form, indeed, of a presidential statement, uh, which won't bear the signatures of the two leaders, but will at least be some small sign of progress. As I say, it's a little early to know whether this is going to happen or even if it happens, whether it'll stop the violence raging in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But tonight, for the first time, some small glimmer of progress. Paul, thanks very much. Here, the Conservatives are calling for a new inquiry into the loan made by the former Treasury Minister Geoffrey Robinson to his colleague Peter Mandelson. Two years ago, both men were forced to resign when the loan became public. Mr Mandelson told a Commons committee that he didn't ask for the loan, but now Mr Robinson says he did. Peter Mandelson's been meeting his Irish counterpart in Belfast tonight, but then he's comfortable with cross-border and sometimes cross-party relationships, his problems with his own side, and now they're after him again. The millionaire who helped Peter Mandelson buy a house is saying the loan was Mr Mandelson's idea, not his own. That's embarrassing, but it's not all. Geoffrey Robinson says Mr. Mandelton is a divisive influence and that has to stop. He's got to change if the government is, able to, is going to be able to uh, function uh, smoothly and efficiently and that disruptive, that, that, that um, destabilizing influence that he can sometimes uh, bring to bear, I, I'm sure he's able to, has got to be subdued. This was the home that cost Peter Mandelson his ministerial job. His enemies liked seeing him out of office, no longer involved in labour feuds and turf wars. But unlike Geoffrey Robinson, he came back. The Tories say Peter Mandelson got off too lightly. Well, it's very disturbing. Uh, Peter Mandelson gave one account to a parliamentary committee. Now Geoffrey Robinson gives another account. And the issue here is can you tell, uh, can you trust a senior minister of the Crown to tell the truth? There's no end to the questions about Geoffrey Robinson's generosity. Did his cash donations go directly to fund Tony Blair's office in opposition and then go undeclared by Labour? The party says no. He supported the party as a whole. Whatever the truth of that, some say this story has become part of a power game between rival factions at the top of government. John Pienaar, BBC News, Westminster. Our political editor Andrew Marr is at Westminster. Uh, Andrew, who said what to whom over a dinner for two is pretty difficult to pin down, I would have thought. How much damage is this actually doing to Peter Mandelson? Well, of course, it was a long time ago. I wonder how many people watching could remember the details of a conversation, even an important conversation they had four years ago. Nevertheless, this is very important because what's happening is that Peter Mandelson's internal foes, and we just heard Geoffrey Robinson there, um, are, are, are saying on the one hand um, that he is destabilizing and devious, and now the Conservatives are coming along and agreeing with that in an extraordinarily personal speech, even by the standards of this place here. Uh, William Hague tomorrow will attack Peter Mandelson as the living embodiment of the, the spin and the deceit and the backbiting and the intrigue at the heart of New Labour. So on the one hand, there's Peter Mandelson's internal critics, uh, and they number a fair few people. 
And on the other hand, there's the Conservative Party. And what's really happening tonight is they're coming together and going directly for Peter Mandelson. And he's a robust, tough character, but this hurts and this damages him. And if there was going to be uh, a cabinet reshuffle uh, coming shortly, and if Peter Mandelson was going to be brought back to the heart of government, this makes it a, lo a great deal harder for Tony Blair to do. But this is knock about personal stuff, isn't it? Is there a really serious political issue anywhere under there? These things only really matter when the personal stuff gets entangled with a great issue of state that affects the rest of us. And that is the case here, because Peter Mandelson is the most pro-Euro minister in the government, uh, constantly pushing Tony Blair. And tomorrow, in the Daily Mail, Geoffrey Robinson will return to the attack and accuse him of constantly destabilising and trying to push the government ever, to, uh, ever closer towards federalism and the Euro. That's at the heart of it, and that matters for all of us. Andrew, thanks very much. And there'll be an interview with Geoffrey Robinson live on Newsnight over on BBC Two straight after this news. The new head of the NHS in England, Nigel Crisp, has admitted tonight that hospitals will again face difficulties this winter. But he says he's confident the health service will cope better than it did last year. Nurses have issued their own warning of bed and staff shortages, which they say could mean more operations being cancelled in the coming months. Never mind a winter crisis, here they've got one already. Four times in the last month alone, Wickham Hospital has simply run out of beds. Local doctors have been told to send their patients elsewhere. To have problems like this in the middle of October is extraordinary, but is also unacceptable. We talk about a winter beds crisis and winter planning and how we're going to sort it out, but we haven't got a winter beds crisis, we have a beds crisis now. Try wiggling them. The problem, too many patients, not enough nurses to care for them. The result, one in ten beds has been closed. The situation in this hospital may be more serious than most, but as winter approaches, others are likely to face similar difficulties. It has got very tight. It has got uncomfortable in the hospital. We have had um, uh, a lot more patients within the department than we, than, than we are comfortable with. I'm just looking at his respite at the moment, it's quite A hard. young nurse learns the complexities of intensive care. Training newly qualified staff in this advanced work is one solution being tried out at Lewisham Hospital in London. And a big effort is underway throughout the NHS to recruit and retain more staff. The question is, will it be enough? I think we're better prepared than we've ever been before. We certainly the new man at the top of the NHS is confident that what can be done will be done. But even with record extra funding, he's under no illusion about the challenges ahead. We've got more nurses, we've got more beds open, we've got a very good relationship with social care. So all of those make me reasonably confident that we will do better than last year and that we will continue to improve. So are you saying there will be no crisis? I'm saying that there will undoubtedly be difficulties in, 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 in a number of areas because there will be difficulties. No one knows exactly what the winter will bring, in spite of more money and better planning, almost everywhere the system is operating close to capacity. Britain's hospitals are bracing themselves for a difficult winter, and so too are their political masters, because the government knows that when it comes to the health service, it will be judged on its record, not on its promises. Neil Dixon, BBC News. At least 17 people have died and more than 20 others are missing after a weekend of torrential rain and mudslides in the Alps. The mountainous borders of France, Italy and Switzerland have been hit the hardest. A state of emergency has been declared in the Val d'Aosta and in the Swiss resort of Gondo, rescuers have found a woman alive under the debris left after a huge mudslide. With barely concealed violence beneath its surface, a mudslide strikes near Martigny in Switzerland one of scores in the last three days to have hit the Alpine region overlapping Switzerland, France and Italy. This is all that's left after a slide struck the Swiss village of Gondo. The sea of mud was 40 metres wide and it obliterated a third of the houses, sweeping them away like so many matchsticks. Eleven people are still missing here, but rescuers have heard tapping and a woman's faint cries for help. They'll work through the night to try to reach her, tunnelling through two metres of debris. Switzerland's president said, we must recognise just how powerful the forces of nature can be. Near Grenoble in the French Alps today, as people hurried to shovel all available materials into makeshift dams, 
the torrent of flood water finally overcame the nearby bridge and electricity substation. Like sandcastles waiting for the tide to knock them over, ruined homes in Italy's Aosta Valley await the inevitable final collapse. These tiny villages, now completely cut off, look as if they've been shelled by an army. That house has stood here 200 years, he says. Now it's not much more than a wall. Even the oldest residents have never seen the like of it. It's a real disaster, she sobs. The Italian government agrees, and tonight it declared a state of emergency in the worsted areas. Across a swathe of northern Italy, normal life has in effect been submerged beneath the floodwaters. No one's sure when the nightmare will end. George Eakin, BBC News. The Environment Agency has warned that contaminated water could pose a health risk to people returning to their homes after last week's floods here. In East Sussex, they're taking measures against further flooding, with yet more rain falling. A costly clean-up operation is underway across the area. Almost all the passengers from the Saudi Arabian airliner that was hijacked to Iraq on Saturday arrived at Heathrow Airport this morning. The passengers, 40 of them British, were flown from Baghdad to, to the Saudi capital, Riyadh, and then caught a special flight to London. HIV infection, the virus that leads to AIDS, is rising at an alarming rate in Britain. According to government figures, the number of new HIV cases is now higher than at any time since the 1980s, when the disease first hit the headlines. Health professionals believe the increase is a result of the mistaken belief that new combination drug treatments can offer a cure. Figures compiled by the Public Health Laboratory Service show that in the early 1990s, about 1,500 people were diagnosed as HIV positive each year. But last year, 3,300 people contracted the virus. And it's estimated that another 10,000 people have HIV but have not yet been diagnosed. Fergal Keane has this, the first in a series of three special reports for the 10 o'clock news on the spread of AIDS. AIDS is a crisis you might think belongs in faraway places, out of step with the prosperity of modern Britain. But the infection rate is set to increase by 50% in the next five years. 60% of infections in Britain have been among gay men. In this bar in the heart of Soho, I wanted to know if AIDS was still something young men worried about when they had sex. Are people taking chances now? Yes, I think people are definitely taking more chances. Particularly among young, young gay people with other young gay people. I, it really doesn't come into it as, as an issue as much as they used to, I don't think, anymore. People are much more prepared to take risks. People are very, very complacent about it, to be honest. Safe sex is not an issue when you've been drinking and whatever. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. The ad campaigns of the 80s and early 90s pushed the safe sex message relentlessly. The result was a change in behavior, a fall off in infection rates. The campaign ceased, the story slipped out of the headlines. AIDS charities fear this has led to complacency. Because we're still sitting on a time bomb. People seem to think that HIV has gone away. Um, very clearly, um, in, in the rest of the world, uh, the consequences of not attending to HIV prevention and health promotion um, is incalculable. We mustn't be complacent. The safer sex message is not getting through to young people. The lower public profile is one problem, but there's now also a view among some that AIDS is less than deadly. There's little doubt that attitudes to HIV, to AIDS, have been radically altered here. The reason? The availability of new drugs, what's called combination therapy, which can dramatically extend the lives of those diagnosed with HIV. The drugs can cost an average of £10,000 a year per person on the NHS. Caroline contracted the virus in 1986 and developed AIDS in the early 90s. She was dying when she was offered the drugs. They've extended her life, but she doesn't know for how long they'll remain effective. I never thought I would see my child growing up, and she's literally just left home a week ago, so that's been very good. But I'm also um, very happily married, and I, and I know that it worries my husband because we can't make plans for the future. 
um, and it's quite hard for him to take on board that I really don't see much further ahead than six months. She takes the drugs going to bed and in the early hours. The greatest worry is that the virus will become drug resistant. Already she's had to change from one combination to another because of side effects. These pills are very toxic. It's not like taking an aspirin. You know, it's not like having a headache and thinking, oh, I'll have a neurofen. It's, it's quite different and, I, and it worries me that people can be complacent in thinking, oh, fine, we'll just take a pill and I'll be all right. That's not the case. Many of the young men in this bar came to sexual maturity at a time when drugs made AIDS seem a lot less deadly. They were children when the AIDS crisis was claiming scores of lives. So it's a, it's a risk you're willing to take? Yes, we all, you know, we'll have, we'll have go out in the street and be run over for a buzz and die. So we all, it's risks everywhere. You know, life is like this, it's full of risks, so yeah. Carefree attitudes are not universal. There are many who do practice safe sex, but AIDS will ruthlessly exploit any complacency. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Central London. Some Indian workers brought to Britain are earning just three pounds a day on British building sites. That's 30 pence an hour. The 10 o'clock news has talked to building workers brought from the subcontinent to live in a shack on site and earn a fraction of what British workers earn. The government's about to relax the rules on foreign workers coming into the country to fill skills shortages. A temple rising in Wembley, built by skilled masons brought from India and housed in a shack on site. They get £3 a day in Britain, double what they would have got back home in India, but a tiny fraction of the going rate for local Wembley stonemasons. What seemed good pay when these men were hired in India doesn't look so good in Britain. Gurujan Sutta says he wants the British legal minimum, eight times greater than what he actually gets. The authorities are investigating. He wants British pay, not Indian. They work for our sister company in India. The contracts for their work has been made in India, and they are seconded to us for a specific job for a specific period of time. Wembley's problem illustrates the bigger global picture. All kinds of skills are there in the third world, and big first world companies are hungry for all of them, particularly as figures show one in five British workers can't read and write properly. Countries that we'd be interested in would be India, software engineers, Philippines for engineering skills, South Africa, again, for engineering skills, uh, Central and Eastern European countries, the government's just changed the rules to let in more skilled people. Big firms can issue their own work permits to foreign workers. Permits will be for five years up from four. And no need to advertise for British workers first. It's not cheap labour. We are only bringing in the very brightest and the very best to fill those key skill shortages in industries that matter to our domestic economy. Britain needs more skilled workers to keep pay costs down. Third world workers and wages will increasingly compete with first world ones. The people working here earn a fortune compared to what they used to back home, but only a fraction of the local British rate. As more and more people take their scarce skills around the globe, those tensions will become ever more acute. Stephen Evans, BBC News, Wembley. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh have begun a state visit to Italy. The Queen will have a short meeting with the Pope tomorrow, but tonight she's at a state banquet in Rome. In the presidential palace, the courtesies of a state visit. And from the Queen, concern over recent floods in Britain and Italy. I would like to express my heartfelt sympathy to all those in both our countries who have been affected by these disasters. Once, state visits were national events. This was 1960. Then came the people's welcome on the drive through Rome. Forty years later, in a Europe grown ever closer, diplomats say a state visit by a British monarch remains distinctive and significant. I think the Italians are fascinated by our monarchy and the level of excitement and curiosity is very high here. I think they're all looking forward to it enormously. 
20 years ago, the Queen, dressed in black, visited the Vatican for a meeting with Pope John Paul. Tomorrow, the symbolism of that meeting will be repeated as monarch and supreme pontiff meet again. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, Rome. In tonight's football, Newcastle United have moved to third place in the FA Carling Premiership after a 3-1 win over Middlesbrough. Newcastle took the lead shortly before half-time after Alan Shearer scored his third goal of the season. And they secured victory after the interval thanks to further goals from Alan Goma and Kieran Dyer. Now it's 25 past 10. I'll be back a little later with the main headlines. But now the news where you are. And the latest in the southeast, I'm Mike Embley. Good evening to you. Victims of a head teacher who sexually abused them are tonight condemning the legal wrangling that let him escape prison for a second time. Robin Peverett, OBE, was head of Dulwich Prep School at Cranbrook in Kent, where the Countess of Wessex was a pupil. He'd admitted nine indecent assaults and been given a suspended jail term. Today, the Attorney General appealed for a harsher sentence, but judges at the appeal court refused, blaming plea bargaining by barristers. Jo Evans remembers vividly her time at Dulwich College Prep School in Cranbrook. She was 10 years old when the then headmaster, Robin Peverett, began abusing her. I mean, I personally was threatened with bad things if I told. You know, I wouldn't be believed and I would end up in serious trouble. And it wasn't until um, the prosecution came to trial and I, and I was told that there were many other people that I actually realised that it wasn't just me. In June, Robin Peverett was given an 18-month suspended prison sentence after admitting he'd indecently assaulted seven of his pupils. Angered that he wasn't jailed, his victims pressed the Attorney General to bring today's case. But it was thrown out when it was revealed Peverett had plea bargained, agreeing to plead guilty to the crimes in return for his liberty. I feel like he's basically attacked us all over again. All of us feel that way. You know, the legal system has really, really let all the witnesses down in this case. I think that the fact that the judge today was very condemning of it um, is certainly consistent with my own view that it should never have happened. Tonight, the Crown Prosecution Service is considering its response and the ramifications of this judgment, while the victims are left to reflect on the shortcomings of the plea bargaining system. Amanda Harper, Newsroom South East, at the Court of Appeal. A Jewish man was seriously hurt today in a racist attack on a bus. Police believe it's linked to the crisis in the Middle East. He was stabbed several times in Stamford Hill, North London, which is home to many Orthodox Jews. The victim in his early 20s was given first aid by staff from a nearby bakery. A man is still being questioned tonight by police. The family of human rights campaigner James Maudsley are celebrating news they've waited more than 400 days to hear. The Burmese government announced today it will release the 27-year-old who's been held since last August for carrying pro-democracy leaflets. James Maudsley was campaigning for the Burmese government to release all political prisoners when he became one himself. He's since been in solitary confinement in a notorious jail 400 miles from the capital, Rangoon. Several times the British government has protested over assaults. When his nose was broken recently and his eyes blackened, officials were told he'd done it himself while handcuffed. His father, David, a London property broker, is overjoyed. I just can't get over this feeling of joy. Gratitude to all the support we've had. Um, I've been able to, as I said, to speak to my um, children. Um, it's going to be great when we all get together, um, maybe even get Jonathan back from Australia. Um, it'll be fantastic. The turning point for Burma's military rulers may have been last week's United Nations ruling that James's detention was unlawful. It could have led to international sanctions. Now his supporters hope he'll be home by the end of the week. But for a man who's been arrested in Burma three times in two years, the next question must be, will he go back or fight on from here in safety? Dan Saladino, News from South East. A government task force is being sent into a hospital in South London to investigate the high death rate among transplant patients. Surgeons at St George's in Tooting suspended all heart and lung transplants. When it emerged, the fatality rate was five times the national average. As Kent's worst floods in 40 years recede, they've left a question mark over plans to build thousands of new homes in the southeast. 
Homeowners are urging the government to look again at new developments, many in the floodplains of the River Medway. Tonight, much of the county is still on flood watch. The Environment Agency wants people to remain on guard for rising water levels. The American expert appointed to run public transport in London is calling on the government to hand him control of the tube as soon as possible. Robert Kiley says he'll be unable to make major improvements elsewhere without running the underground. Mr Kiley could earn up to £2 million if he transforms transport in London. Graffiti-strewn carriages, muggings and train derailments were an everyday part of commuting in New York in the 1980s. Today the picture is very different and the credit has been given to Robert Kiley, who ran the service for seven years. One of the changes he'd like to make in London is to mirror New York's round-the-clock subway. Maybe that's not something you, you, you do right away because you've got to make sure that the basic service is been, being delivered well. But for London to continue to grow and to be the, the cosmopolitan center that it is, the international uh, financial center, the center of, financial center of Europe, uh, transportation needs to work around the clock. Ministers have already rejected a New York-style bond issue to fund improvements. They're waiting to sign contracts with private companies instead. Mr. Kiley would like them to reconsider. They do work. America's infrastructure has been built through the municipal bond market. However it's funded, he's pressing ministers to hand over the tube as soon as possible. I don't think this will come as a startling message to, to, to the government uh, or, or to anyone else who worries about transportation. The underground is crucial. It's not to say that there aren't some good things that can be done with buses, but the underground is where the real action is. Bob Kiley is preparing to leave New York for his first visit to London as its new transport boss. But tonight he's laid down a challenge to the government, demanding control of the underground sooner rather than later so he can start earning his £2 million. Sean Lane, Newsroom, South East, New York. We'll be back tomorrow in breakfast on BBC One and News 24 with regular travel and weather updates. And there's South East News round the clock on CFAX, page 160, Sport on 390. A very good night from all of us now. Back to Michael Burke. And the main news tonight. President Clinton has delayed his departure from the deadlocked Middle East peace talks. He's staying to continue efforts to try to secure a ceasefire between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But on the streets, the fighting continued. Today was another day of bloodshed and mass protest across the region. And here the Conservatives are calling for a new inquiry into the home loan made to Peter Mandelson by the former Treasury Minister, Geoffrey Robinson. Well, Newsnight is about to start now over on BBC Two, but from the 10 o'clock news, good night. Good evening. You may have heard on the news about the flood situation in Switzerland where we've had 500 millimetres of rain, five, 19 inches in just five days. And this footage is taken in Switzerland during today. It shows the extent of the major devastation as those rivers burst their banks. Now, although the rain won't be as persistent for the next couple of days, low pressure never too far away will keep things rather showery and unsettled here. And an unsettled feel across the British Isles. During Monday, we've had another 17 millimetres of rain in Hastings. That's lifted the river levels in parts of Sussex and, Sussex and Kent onto flood warning once again. And you can gain more information from the flood line 0845 988 now the good news is the low pressure that brought the rain is clearing out of the way now. We have a ridge of high pressure, so a dry night for most of us, but then we have another deepening area of low pressure making its way towards us. So by tomorrow night, another spell of wet and windy weather is on the cards. And any more rain falling on already sodden ground in many parts of the UK will bring with it the risk of further local flooding. So we need to keep an eye on that. For the meantime, things are quietening down. The rain just affecting northeast Scotland, clearing eventually from Shetland, and even the showers are dampening down in northwestern areas. So for most, it will be a fine night, if a little misty in places, and quite cold. Two to four degrees is low enough for a touch of frost on the grass and on the cars, first thing. But otherwise, a fine start. For many parts of Wales, England and eastern Scotland, it should be a dry day. Any little bits of mist and fog floating around first thing will clear. But the rain will be gathering in the west in the morning. Patchy rain turning more persistent for Northern Ireland and western Scotland into the afternoon. And eventually by the evening coming into western parts 
of England and Wales. But for many eastern parts of England, we should hold on to some sunshine for much of the day, lifting temperatures to 14 or 15 degrees. So a much brighter day, really quite pleasant in the sunshine. But with that strengthening wind further west, it'll feel quite cold. We're looking at gusts up to 50 or 60 miles an hour, so quite a windy day. And that wet and windy weather will continue its progress eastwards during Tuesday night, which means another wet day for eastern England on Wednesday. Showers in the north and the west, squally winds lasting well into Thursday. Hopefully drier by then in the south and the east, but another low pressure threatening more wind and rain by Friday. Tuesday on BBC One. At 8.30, the best kept secret on the planet. Your world's gonna end. Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. We'll take it from here. And the Men in Black. I'll make this look good. And after Men in Black, join us for the BBC 10 o'clock news. That's the new look this Tuesday on BBC One. I've had an absolutely enormous bosom since I was about six. It's part of my personality and I feel quite, not, not sorry for, but I feel it's a shame for girls that don't have huge bosoms actually, because they'll never know quite what that feeling is like. Although I have to say that I am envious, obviously, when it comes to running and um, lying down. <laughs> it's getting away lying down. Yeah, no, lying down is quite interesting because of course, where do they go? <laughs> I quite like to know, I find them in my socks sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> On BBC One, three women, different needs, but all with the same aim. Proving revenge is sweet, Bette Midler, Goldie Horn, and Diane Keaton star in the first Wives Club. <laughs>